Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever time you're tuning in the program called What's Going On here at allpointstv.com. I'm George Moss, and we tape every Monday from 2 o'clock to 3, but whatever time you're tuning us in, that's the time we want to welcome you. And we are very delighted to have you four days before Christmas. So Merry Christmas to all, and a Happy New Year. And I think we need to get back to saying Merry Christmas in the country. And um, this happy holidays that I keep hearing wherever I go, all the stores. I'm checking out in the lanes and everybody's telling me happy holidays. I'm trying to figure out what, what holidays are we getting ready to celebrate. <clears throat> and I do have a suggestion here and that is, <clears throat> you know, get a, list of <laughs> get a list of all the holidays and just read them off. If you, want, if you want to get involved in all the holidays we're celebrating around this time, then just simply read the list off and just simply mention it. <clears throat> but Happy Holidays is too, gen too generic for me, too general. See, in defense of this, though, holidays actually means the derivative of holy days. So I think that's kind of nice and that, that that's the original source of these, these, you know, these kind of these, um, certain significant days. It was the original source was holy days relating to some kind of practice of religion. But I mean, I, I could see it going too far, but I mean, holidays to me is like, yeah, I could see if like uh, the Festivus is one that they're using now on, um, you know, on the East Coast Festivus because it was, uh, some, I think it was Seinfeld, somebody came up with that term, fest and some people are now using it as, it just shows how much of it, how much ducks they are or how, sh how much sheeps they are. They're, they're willing to go on somebody from a sitcom creating a, you know, creating <laughs> Their, their holidays, you know, so. Yeah, I, I tell you how I see it. I, I see it as um, a continuation of the attack upon our traditions in this country. And <clears throat> there was a time when I, I was, I saw the X must, and uh, the Christ was taken out of it, and I saw the X there in this place, and I saw some other things going on. <clears throat> and now what I see in this political correctness being expanded, I see them going to the excess in another direction where we don't even mention Christmas at all. At least we would say Merry Xmas and we kind of knew X, okay, and Christmas. And we've uh, even changed that now to Happy Holidays. And I have no problem with all the holidays as long as we are aware of what we are doing and that some of that I think has to do with political correctness. But we don't want to stand out as being um, someone that is not recognizing someone else and I don't know what other country you can go into, maybe all, all the Western countries, but I don't think you can go into other parts of the world where you're going to convince people to X out what their traditions are and adopt the mindset and viewpoints of those who just came recently onto the soil. <clears throat> I mean, what are the traditions that they found when they got here and why they be changed once they arrived? <clears throat> so uh, when I hear Happy Holidays, quite frankly, I, I, I don't say Happy Holidays in return. I, I say Merry Christmas, and I want to. I want them to say Merry Christmas, and then if you want to say Happy Hanukkah, I don't have a problem with that. And if there's another holiday around this time period, Kwanzaa, that's fine with me also. But uh, give me the specifics and speak to me in in very specific language. I don't like the generic language where you're telling me that it's all comprehensive, and I can just kind of figure out which one you're talking about. Tell me which one we we have out there, and how. I'll, I'll be able to uh, be with you on that, on that particular page. You know, for years though, I've been hearing that, you know, well, Christmas <laughs> is actually Christmas. Everything we call Christmas celebration is uh, co-opted from the pagan holidays and stuff. Yeah. Well, okay, and there's somebody out there now <laughs> making a case that that's actually just the opposite, yeah. that a lot of people were embracing. Now, I can tell you the, you know, the tr the Christmas tree and the that stuff, that was not, you know, the Christian. I mean, and actually the old-time Presbyterians, but some people consider like the Orthodox Presbyterians, Christmas wasn't a special holiday at their church. It was on their calendar. And we did allow the um, Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, did retain a lot of the what some people call the pagan elements, like the Christmas tree and all that stuff, because they were in so many other countries, you know, they had made inroads into evangelization that they brought those into Christmas. And I don't see a big issue with that. I mean, I don't understand, you know, I don't understand like, uh, Santa Claus, and I, I don't understand that. I never did believe in Santa Claus even as a kid. I angered a lot of my friends' parents because I told the kids or the, their kids that there was no such thing as Santa Claus. And I was considered like, you know, nowadays, and one of those militant atheists nowadays, you know, I was akin to them. But, um, no, I think that um, Christmas is actually... I'd like to know another thing is too. These liberals want us to be tolerant, loving, cheerful, uh, hating, you know, respectful towards enemies. What kind of what religious organization, what religious tradition teaches that, other than Christianity? Mm -hmm. 
Bo- Buddhism doesn't tell you this great tolerance or love towards your enemies because they don't even uh, they they know that people are going to be striving against you, but they don't they don't try to articulate how to try to win them over or how to forgive. And if in the book of the the Quran, from what I've read. God's forgiving, but that's not a requirement upon a people. Mm-hmm. So there's a big difference there. So they got to start. They're going to throw their baby out of the bathwater. Essentially, yeah, I, I think that we we have got to be very careful <clears throat> because political correctness is kind of like it is. It's really a form of book burning, and I don't mean that we are out here, you know, throwing anything into fires. I'm saying that. We're involved in a kind of historical erasure where we are, we are losing <clears throat> some of the fundamentals upon which we have uh, made this nation great and we have some uh, patterns of behavior that we are changing <clears throat> that brought us to this particular uh, point and we are now throwing that away as if it doesn't uh, matter <clears throat> as we go forward. We have to look back in order to go forward, and we look back at our traditions. And one of them is, uh, what do we do around this time of the year? <clears throat> and we can do a lot of other things, too. It can be uh, more inclusive, but it does not mean throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And I want, when I, when I go to the store, I want to hear, you know, Merry Christmas. <laughs> oh, I'm not shopping there. <laughs> I went to one, I went to this drugstore, I'm not going to call a name out, but I went to this drugstore and this guy almost got in my face. I, 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 I said, uh, Merry Christmas, and the guy almost uh, stuck his chest out and said, what are you talking about? And said, uh, Happy Holidays. And said it so aggressively, I wanted to sit up and reach across the counter and smack him one. <laughs> because I, 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 I don't have a problem with other people having a celebration of that which they hold uh, dear. <clears throat> but let's be honest about where we are coming from and where this country uh, has come from. And that is we come, we come from a tradition. And that tradition is, is not all this other stuff that we're adding to the mix. We come out of a, of a Judeo-Christian uh, um, tradition. And I know a lot of people are now saying that at the table when they were actually uh, beginning to do the pronouncements, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and we're now saying everyone was sitting there at the table. Muslims were there, according to what Obama is saying, and uh, uh, they were there in terms of the foundation of the nation, all of these other things that they're saying. They're making this stuff out of, out of whole cloth. It sounds to me like Hillary Clinton uh, uh, that, 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 that we have here. You know, I'm they're making a, stuff out, up out of whole, whole cloth. I consider myself pretty well versed in American history. Did quite well throughout the classes in college, high school <laughs> I had of it. I never remember us drawing from any Muslim source <laughs> for the founding. We actually, we drew from, and we drew from pagan ideas, like, you know, the ideas of democracy, Greece and Rome. We uh, drew from um, the ideas of you know, of uh, philosophers who are considered free thinkers or actually striving against the, you know, established church of mm-hmm. Europe. Like, uh, you know, I think Montesquieu is actually in opposition. You know, we drew of the Spirit of Laws as a book we drew from him, the founders did. John Locke uh, was a major, you know, uh, fra- you know, part of the concept about the life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. He actually said pursuit of property, but then you change it to happiness. Mm-hmm. But that almost is a You're direct right. quote right from Locke. He had some issues with the established church of England at the time. It was considered a, a um, maybe an agnostic by our standard, even some people by an atheist. So, but even then, then even then, they weren't so arrogant to try to destroy the total bulwark of a society. Mm-hmm. They had issues on a personal level, but they allowed for because they realized so many people were of that persuasion. I guess you know, you know, philosophical persuasion of Christianity that they basically they had to depend upon it to actually create a society. Yeah, the, you, and you're quoting uh, those Western thinkers. The the philosophy was not from the East. The philosophy was from from uh, uh, Western Europe, uh, ha- having gone through the Enlightenment period, and the Enlightenment was going on over here as well. Uh, and the best thinkers, the best thinkers, the philosophical grounding points of the nation came out of Western thought. And we can say what we want to about about it, but the expansion through the colonial period, as it was expressed through the the European theater, and therein, uh, it was expansion of the Western ideals that were placed in other parts of the world. We served the world uh, better. It, it was anything better than what they had at that at that point in time, and we see its um, foundational points in parts of the world right now, 
where they've taken those principles. I mean, it was out of the box thinking in this country when you had those great persons meeting and uh, drawing up the document, the Declaration, Declaration of Independence, and assigning the writers that could bring about it through the thought they had, um, some of the thinkers we had. I think these are the, I think uh, Rand is right in saying these were the world's, this, this was the country's first uh, intellectuals. And Ayn Rand says, and so far, their last, uh, our last intellectuals. You can't call the stuff they're doing right now as intellectual. Well, there's nothing intellectual about what's going on right now. It's an anti-intellectual movement that we have in the United States. But at that point, we had the greatest array of intellectuals in one place the world had ever seen. Show me, show me what you had. Show me even in Greece. <clears throat> and I know, um, uh, you know, you study uh, Greek history. I studied one of the courses. I wish they'd bring it back. Uh, that they had when I was in college was Western civilization. And, and you have to have, this will be admired Western civilization. You have to have one year of Western, they call it Western Civ, and everybody, uh, I'm not sure if all the schools did it. I know at the, where I was, I was in a private school, and, well, a, you know, a church based school, Presbyterian. And, uh, and, and Western Seal was a requirement. I think it was a requirement in, in, in many of the colleges at that time. And then we just threw it away as if it didn't, it didn't really amount to anything. And all of a sudden we don't teach Western civilization in, anymore. You know, we don't, we don't really teach and we don't even require in universities now American history to be taken. That's how much we have gotten out of an admiration, you know, of ourselves. And, and we, are, we are in the West. And there are people wearing, you know, kente cloth and wearing all these uh, gowns and things like that on the university campus. They, they, don't, they don't represent any of that. They don't they even understand what it is that they have. And you can carry that kente cloth into parts of Africa outside of Ghana, and they won't understand it. You can, carry, you can wear kente cloth over there in uh, Nigeria and see what you get. Who, who, what group would wear the Desheki thing, you know, that... The, the Desheki, you know that, it's like a robe or a kaftan. I'd consider it like a kaftan. Which tribe or people of Africa would wear one of those? Well, if you talk, it depends on what, what, what array you're talking about because all of them, you know, each ethnic group has its own, own attire. I, I saw one, one um, I, I, was, I was reading a post. I have some friends in Nigeria. And this one, one of my friends was wearing uh, some, clo some clothing from Nigeria, this per, I'm an Igbo chief, so, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not an uh, honorary Igbo chief, I'm an Igbo chief. It wasn't, it's not honorary, where you just simply say, okay, you, you know, I, uh, <laughs> it's not honorary. And there was an Igbo that was wearing a Yoruba outfit. You know, Igbo in the eastern, southern eastern part of uh, Nigeria, and over to the western part of Nigeria, you have the Yoruba. And uh, I don't know if, they, if, if, if there was a friend that, was, uh, was, that had influenced the, uh, the attire. But I, I read in one of the posts that this person's uh, brother was criticizing the attire and said, um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't being nasty, just simply wanted to know why are you wearing uh, that attire? Because they recognized it wasn't the attire that the Igbo uh, uh, wear. And I've been in many parts of Africa, 17 countries in Africa, and I'll tell you something, I didn't see anybody wearing, uh, I didn't see anybody, I was in Ghana in 2006, and I didn't see, and I went to where they made the, uh, the I saw where the Kente cloth was, was being made in one of the uh, places in, in, uh, in, uh, in Ghana. And I didn't see Anyone wearing it, even in Ghana, there was not a shanti. <clears throat> if you are another indigenous, in, indigene, indigene in Ghana, you did not wear the kente cloth. And I've been under professors. I heard uh, I, I was sitting with professors in Ghana, <clears throat> and. Um, sit in on some of the lectures and they were telling me that about this uh, story that goes back to 1695 where the Ashanti you know claimed to have the golden stool 
that came down from uh, heaven. I forget the, 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 they would call them the wish doctor, but I don't take the name wish doctor as being a serious term or who they were. These were the, uh, but they certainly were, were, were magicians. You know, magicians, uh, magic is, a, is part of religion. It's been separated from it now, but at, at one, one time, you said in the Bible where Moses is doing magical acts in front of the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh had his magicians, and that's the way religion played out. And um, I forget the magician's name, the, the, um, the one in the, uh, the, the Oyo, um, it name escapes me right now, but in 1695, I, I heard um, one of the professors in Ghana that was saying in a lecture that you know, he didn't believe the story. <laughs> now, I tell you this, he better not say it to any Ashanti, and there, and there was no Ashanti in that room when he said it. Now, uh, there's a professor over there named, uh, and I, I spoke to her sitting next to her at a dinner, had a nice conversation with her, named uh, Dr. Akosha uh, uh, Purby, which means she was born on Wednesday. And we had a nice conversation. I admired her because I saw in the Gates piece that she did in 2000 and I also read her comments in the book called um, uh, Wonders of the African World, page 205, 205 to page 207 of that book. And I read her comments and I was telling her how much I admired her for being honest and we had a nice conversation. But I tell you this, that professor, in fact, they were speaking in the same program but at different times, if a culture Purby had been in that room, out of respect for a culture, he would not he would not have said that. <clears throat> because he'd been talking to a person that's a shanti who would have had that belief and would have taken it as an offense. And my point um, my point is this. My my point is that you got probably two thousand different ethnic languages in Africa. Africa is one of the most diverse continents in the world. And they made it they made it not a diverse place, but making it making the scene. You're talking about one group. You go in Africa. You go next door and find uh, diversity. I was I was uh, there were people telling me about the diversity in the in the Mandingo, uh, the uh, people that are Mandingo that were in uh, there. There's a Mandingo group in uh, Guinea um, Bissau, and there's another uh, Mandingo group in Guinea uh, Conakry. Meaning that in, in the Malian Empire, you know, when it broke up, you have, um, and so they made a distinction between the two Madinka groups in the two Guineas. Guinea, they call one Guinea, Guinea uh, Kanaki, because talking here about uh, uh, French Guinea, <clears throat> the one that, um, since they just got through celebrating uh, Stokely Carmichael on, on uh, one of the uh, networks. Uh, who died in Africa, by the way, he died in, uh, in Guinea, um, Kanaki, meaning he died in the Guinea that was under this, uh, uh, the president that gained independence of Guinea named Sekou Touré. And Sekou Carmichael, as you remember, changed his name to Kwame Touré, naming himself after Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana and Sekou Touré of, uh, of Guinea. And I, I, I've been, well, I've sat with uh, people <coughs> in these uh, all-night sessions where uh, they would make a distinction between the Madinka and the two different places because of the accent of the language would be different. And they can hear the accent. I can't hear any accent over there. And I, I'm sure they look at me. I have an accent. And we don't think we have an accent. When we go around other people, believe me, there's an accent there that they hear. And they can tell where you're from because they hear your accent. And although they may be speaking English. And and so I, I've, I've seen all these distinctions here. And this idea that uh, all the people are wearing kente cloth, which is what these guys, these professors, try to make it seem like, just put kente cloth on and you're an African. And, uh, that's what, and, and the fact is that in, Af in Africa, on the continent of Africa, only one group, one, how do you say one in, in Spanish? Uno. <laughs> Only one group would wear that cloth because the other the other groups would not wear it because it's not their ethnic you know group it's not their culture and not their cultural reference and I'll tell you this you go in a lot of you go into Africa they get your you get your feelings hurt because you go in there talking about you African American you go over there and try that stuff and tell them that 
I've been in a lot of discussions. I took some students over there. I, well, I was with the group. Well, teachers, uh, instructors went over there with some students. And on two different occasions, 2006 and 2009, and I was over there with a lot of college students. There was some from the University of Georgia, some from Savannah, um, whatever college it is there in Georgia. And uh, Georgia State, I think some students were there. We were all there at the same time. And I come down from my um, room on whatever, I think it was on the third floor. I think it was on the third floor. And I come down and they'd be in, in a heated discussion in the lobby. And I would come down there and they'd be in these heated discussions with these uh, people from Nigeria. And they think they're going to teach the Nigerians something about their own culture. And they know better than the Nigerians knew because they come with this idea of, you know, one Africa. And uh, they have their indigenous, you know, way of looking at things. And they couldn't understand how that could be because it's just one Africa. It was the idea that they had come from the United States. So I come down and they'd be in these heated discussions. And they would say, Professor Miles, because uh, we had been in workshops together, Professor Miles, come over here and tell and let me come over and get the Nigerians straight. Tell them, don't we call ourselves African Americans? So I would say, uh, yes, we do. But that's not what they argue with you about. What the Nigerians are arguing with you about is that you can is that you may well call yourself that. What they're telling you is they don't agree with you. See, they thought that the denial was they couldn't believe that over there they would actually say that. They never denied that they were not over here saying that. What they were saying was that over there where you're saying it, you say it over there, but if you say it over here, we got a problem with it. You can say it over there until the cows come home. What you say over here matters when you get over here because when you say it over here, we're going to make a correction. They're not coming to the United States to make a correction. They're making a correction where they are, and they're saying they don't buy it. And I've been, I've been in 17 countries in Africa. I'll tell you this. They don't buy it anywhere in Africa that I've been. And I think I've been pretty much in all the places in terms of when you go to 17 countries, it's not just those persons that are there. There's migration in Africa too. And so you, you run into a whole lot of the other groups that are not in those particular countries, indigenous to those countries, that are in those countries as migrants. Not a, not a lot, but some. I, I talked to people online who are from African nations, and they had refugees coming in from other countries because mm -hmm. of the warfare or strife and, you know, civil affairs, civil problems in the one country to the next. And they had some, they, they're not so opening because they're not all these African brothers in arms kind of stuff. I mean, they have some of their ethnic groups and their, their own tribal affiliations that are just as strong as any of the Europeans <laughs> or the white person against the black person in this country. They th every, and I have people who think that all of you, Africa, and these are blacks I've talked to, think that all Africa is like united in one. And I went, <laughs> you, there's like, people are people. They're going to they're gonna divvy yeah. up things and put barriers up between them like everybody else. Yeah, I, I'll tell you this, the moral of the story here is... Why, uh, why give up your cultural reference point just because the other person's on the same soil? They don't give it up over there. And one of the reasons why there is no African language spoken in the parliament anywhere in Africa. There is no indigenous language spoken in the parliament anywhere in Africa except in Somalia. Where, they, where, they, where the, the language of the parliament is Kiswahili. Nowhere else is an indigenous African language the language of a parliament anywhere else in Africa except Somalia. The languages of non-indigenous languages. And the reason for that is because of this writer over in Kenya having explained it who said that why is it that they don't use in Kenya the Kukuya language or the, or the Lu, L-U-O, the Lu? And the reason for it is because if they use the Lu in the parliament in Kenya and not English, which is what they use, because Kenya was colonized by the English, if they use a Lu language, or if they use the Kukuya language, Kukuya being the largest group and Lu being the second largest group in Kenya, 
then you would have the Lu if the Kukuya language was used, or you'd have the Kukuya if the Lu language was used, the Lu or the Ken Kukuya language. The other group would, would see it as either Kukuya imperialism, cultural imperialism, or Lu cultural imperialism, and that's why it is not used. They use the the neutral uh, language, the colonial language. Well, isn't it too during the time? I'm not going to change that. During as apartheid was ending, or you're trying to wrap it up, you know, in uh, South Africa, the African National Congress comprised mostly of Bantu speakers, correct? No, the 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 African National Congress is um, the ANC, which is um, you know I'm you getting I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, no, they they are the. Um, um, the, uh, the the Hausa. Okay, okay. Because I know that one group was like a group. They actually had opposition to each other because of their, you know, their their cultural differences too. One was accused of siding more with the, you know, the apartheid, you know, white government. Mm -hmm. You know, the other one was like a, they were apprehensive about. They didn't want to see the other group get control when that was. Yeah, that's away. true. That's what it was. I forget which one is. Yeah, I put lazy. The, the, the Zulu. Yeah, the Zulu. That's exactly what I thought it was Zulu. Zulu. The, yeah, you the, said Zulu. I thought it was going to be Zulu or the, that yeah. or the Messiah. I don't know which yeah, one it Zulu. was. Yeah, Zulu. No, uh, Buddha lazy. Uh, gotcha, gotcha, uh, Buddha lazy. Uh, when when Mandela came over to the United States back in the time period that Mandela was really hot because he just got out of prison after spending 27 years in jail, got out of prison in 1991, and of course they had been grooming him while he was in prison, knowing they're going to eventually let him have to let him go. So we're kind of going into the cell and kind of grooming him because once he came out, they knew he's going to be big enough to be, he's, he's going to be president of, of, um, of South Africa and as an ANC member. So when he came to the United States, I was there when he uh, went, he was in Detroit. I went, I went down to the stadium when in the, it was in Detroit. And um, when, he, when, he was on, uh, when he was on Nightline, Gotcha Budalese called into the studio to talk to Mandela, who was in the United States. And he was calling from South Africa. And he told Mandela, he said, my brother, I've been calling and calling, and you have not been answering my call, and blah, blah, blah. It was a very interesting conversation, because Mandela answered him, and he said this to him, and I don't think many persons understood what Mandela was saying. But here's what Mandela said, and I'll interpret it for you. He said, well, first let me say this, M Mandela was, was offended that he would talk to him while he was on foreign soil. That's another thing that Obama needs to learn. When you're on foreign so soil, you do not, in fact, criticize your country outside your country. <clears throat> but he hasn't learned that because we got an idiot in the White House. I said that. That's what we have. And he said to Booty Lazy, you know that the issue is no longer simple. And then he said, and this is very crucial, I am a disciplined member of the ANC, the African National Congress. Meaning that when Mandela was in prison, all of South Africa was united around that fact. And the unity the Hausa, the Zulu, the other groups could unite around that incarceration, even those that disagreed with him and were in different ethnic group. What Mandela was saying, though, by his release, though, he's released out of that, and now the individuality of the situation comes into play. The Hausa, the Zulu, the other groups. And that's what Mandela was telling him, when the issue is no longer simple, that which, that which unite, you know how you say things like, um, the enemy of my enemy is my friend? Well, that's only true up to a point. What happens when the enemy is removed? That's common to both. What do the two enemies on the same side while the enemies are there? What do you do at that point? Let me tell you what a corollary would, would, to that would be. This, this, this hot air they have right now with Donald Trump. You know, they're saying that... <laughs> They up here arguing with Donald Trump because Donald Trump and Putin are on the same page. They're complimenting each other. Donald Trump said good things about uh, Vladimir uh, Putin and Putin said good things about Donald Trump. And they got a problem with that. Well, did you see 
Joseph Stalin sitting there at Yalta with Stalin. Yeah, Churchill was there too. But Stalin, Joseph Stalin was there. I tell you, I tell you, he was not there. Charles de Gaulle wasn't there. And he never, and he never forgave uh, them for that, um, uh, you know, either. That's why he tried to d destroy later on in '59 when he when he called for the uh, cash to be traded in for the gold instead of that run on the gold here in the United States. That's why he did that because they had embarrassed him and kept him um, out. And he didn't like that. He began to, attack, you know, after, after he began to understand what's going on here with this uh, printing of money, he began to challenge, the, challenge the, uh, the West, the other parts of the West. You know what I would have told De Gaulle when he demanded payment in gold? Okay, we'll extract what you owe us first, <laughs> okay, for two wars, okay, for helping you yeah, in two right. wars. Into lend lease program. You know, that's another thing. We never collected a dime except from. No, we, we, because it was stupid, just like Donald Trump said. You know, when, they, when, when De Gaulle told. Told uh, the American, told this ambassador, uh, Yankees go home. They asked, they, he asked Charles de Gaulle, does that include the, uh, the Americans buried out there in Flanders Field? Does it include them? Should they go home too, the ones that are standing up there between the French and the Germans? Does that include that group? It's like, you know, Americans, and I've had, I've had a year, I had, I had a Lebanese guy try to tell me that, well, you owed it to France because of, you know, they, they helped you in the revolution. I went, we helped them in two wars, and we had a massive loss of life in both for the, defending them. We made, well, on our first, our first, you know, contribution to the war effort for World War One. I, I think we basically, you know, sealed up any kind of, you know, payment back to these people for what they, the kindness they showed us. During the time of our revolution, you know, when they were getting off the, they were getting off the ships and stuff. The, the American men are saying Lafayette, we are here. Uh, you know, that's what a lot of them would say. Yeah. <laughs> and I could say a response like, you know, Lafayette helped us out during our time of our yeah. struggle to become a nation. <laughs> so I mean, but yeah, I mean, these. And but the thing is, everybody's indoctrinated. You think the United States owes somebody else. When you're looking at like yeah. the UN, UN's asking us, you're in the rears with us. They're saying, I was like. Well, yeah. What about all the uh, peacekeeping missions we've largely supplied? You know, we don't get any credit for it. You know, and and, and just about Lafayette. Let me tell you how, how Lincoln uh, paid Lafayette back. Lincoln used a prison, a fort really, off the coast in the harbor of New York named Lafayette uh, 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 Fort to imprison those 13,000 people that he put in jail <clears throat> during the Civil War. Somebody run and tell that story. And it was called Lafayette, named after the great uh, Lafayette. The person that sided with, because they both had the common enemy at that point, which is Britain. You know, France was fighting Britain as well. And so part of the help that was um, helping to turn the tide was we shared the, the enemy uh, in, in common. That is, we were, France was helping us out in that war. Now look at the Gaulle later. Well, that's, that's why that happens, because the, the enemy... If your enemy is your friend, while the common foe stands there. But things change. And Mandela was making that point, and, and Trump was making that point right now that people can't understand. Yeah, and, 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 and Trump, it, you know, Trump is right on so many different things. <clears throat> That's why I was glad to see this weekend that Phyllis uh, Scaffley, you know, which is uh, who, who had, who's an icon in the conservative community, the woman was born in 1924. She's like 91 years old right now. That woman is an iconic conservative figure. And she came out last week. I hope you, I hope you read it. Where she came out and said this now that um, the only hope we have, and John and I talk off camera about it. Uh, I think John has surrendered a lot more than I have. <laughs> I'm still fighting to think that, you know, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, I don't think it's, we read this sick of forking it yet. John, I think you think it's time to put a, put a sick of fork in it because it's done. I, I think there's still some, you know, it's still a little bit of daylight here. And we're going to see if that is, in fact, closed out. We'll find, out, out, we'll find that out pretty quickly in 2016 because we, can, we, we got a question on the table here. And that question got to be answered. It got to be answered immediately in the next election. Or, that, uh, or it is time to put a fork in it. But she said that Donald Trump is the only one that 
is standing up to do the things that are needed to get this country on the right track. Now, there's some others that are talking about it. They're all outsiders. Ted Cruz is not one of them. Ted Cruz is an insider trying to act like he's an outsider. You can't be inside and then say you're an outsider. Now, John, John McCain tried that in 2008. We didn't buy it then, don't buy it now. If you're on the inside, you're an insider. And we need to understand that because when the outsiders become insiders, we need to get them back out again. That's how it's got to work. We need to understand what the framers were talking about when they had this idea that we should have a citizen's government. Once you have the persons go in to political power and they stay there, they're not part of the citizen uh, government anymore. They're part of the government that is against the citizens. And I'm trying to write about that because I'm trying to write clearly about what history is teaching us. And history is very clear about that. And that is that we have a, a non-citizen participatory, participatory government in this country. And that's our problem. And we can claim all these things. Want. You, you can claim all you want to. You're going to go from this party and you're going to vote that party. You can put John Boehner out of there and put Paul Ryan in there. And guess what? Nothing changes. Or you can take um, uh, this uh, McConnell. Uh, Mitch McConnell, and put him in there from uh, from uh, Kentucky, and take out this uh, derelict from uh, Nevada, and put him in there. And, and what you see here is what the same thing happening, regardless as to those persons that are in there, <clears throat> because they're all insiders, and people get their feelings here when they start trying to choose which one. They want from inside the beltway. They're, look here, you, you can keep doing that to the cows come home. Nothing's going to change. And Donald Trump is an outsider, and that is our hope. And when he gets inside, it means that that's a change in his, in his um, relationship to us. And we need to understand that and stop giving these persons license to just stand up there forever and a day in his elective office. But Trump is exactly right in terms of what he's doing right now in terms of Putin. There's a love fest going on. You know why? Because Russia is not our main problem right now. Reagan held that problem. You know, people got to stop fighting battles we've already won. You know what's like um well like you know you brought up about the fact that Trump and Putin are like basically in this basically love Reagan solved that problem. Well, you know how they say right now that basically essentially Obama and uh, Putin are like now Obama um Putin and uh you know Trump are actually you know, exchanging pleasantries and you know the congratulations and to each other. Basically, it was because of the reputation Reagan had from the dossier that came out after after the Soviet Union fell about what they had on Reagan means what he says says what he means. Okay, when you got a person they know okay so if you got somebody they respect and they're saying openly that they admire and respect mm -hmm. if you want to deal with Russia effectively get somebody who they're probably might be a little bit intimidated by you know because that's what they're that's still bad and those people that's where that that's where that culture is John you hit, a, you, hit, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head with a sledgehammer you know Hillary Clinton said last week in the debate they didn't call it that this this um, uh, love fest we started out with Bernie you know we want to call him Bernie Bernie Sanders Bernard Sanders who started out with the moderator, who was uh, a cheerleader for Hillary Clinton, asking him if he wanted to apologize because someone in his campaign, Bernie Sanders' campaign, had gone into the database of Hillary Clinton, extracted out some of the names, and were using that as a part of the weaponry that was being aimed at Hillary Clinton by the campaign that's being waged by Bernie Sanders. And of course, the moderator wanted him to stand down from that, asking if he wanted to apologize. And of course, here comes Bernie Sanders, of course, uh, the man that is running as a Democratic Socialist. And of course, he's the next George Washington. And he couldn't tell a lie. So he says, I not only do I want to apologize to Hillary Clinton, I want to apologize to my campaign and to my staff and to everybody else. And blah, blah, blah. I'm running. I, that's not the kind of cam campaign I'm running. So he's running, a, he's running an innocent uh, campaign, a virtuous campaign. So what does that mean? He's not a politician. But in the campaign, in the uh, debate, Hillary Clinton gets up there and says, as if we haven't had enough about this, this video stuff, 
and said that the people in the Middle East are showing videos of Donald Trump that is in fact saying he didn't want Muslims in the United States and they're using that as a recruiting tool, going from door to door and doing that. And they're using it to recruit Muslims to jihad. Folks, this woman has, um, in, in 2012, this woman used a video, a claim of a video, having caused Benghazi, and the person made the video, they put this person in jail. And that video had nothing to do with what happened in, in Benghazi where a United States ambassador along with three others was killed. And they're talking about this woman running as the Democratic Party's nominee for President of the United States. This, this party has absolutely no shame. And we're going to have a test in 2012, in 2016, regardless as to who the candidate is in the Republican Party. I hope, I hope it's Donald Trump, an outsider, because there's no answer on the inside. And that's what Larry, uh, one of the, the, the Cook, bro Cook brothers was, uh, was saying, when he was saying on one of the, uh, they had him on, uh, I won't even name the program because this woman is totally uh, uh, biased. But it's on one of the Fox um, uh, station, uh, one of the uh, Fox programs, and she had um, had him on there, and he said that he didn't think any politician would solve, uh, would do what's necessary to solve the problem. He's right about that because he's going to make a political decision, and uh, because they, because politicians make 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 political decisions, they don't make statesman uh, decisions. We, we, don't, we don't have uh, statesmen, we have politicians in, in America. And we need to, you know, root them out on a regular basis. You can't let them languish in power over long periods of time. You have to root them out of there. Because when they're in power, as politicians doing the political things, they do things that's not in the interest of the country. And you can just forget that they're going to change their mind and do the statesman-like thing because it's not going to happen. Because that's not who they are. And so, um, um, here's Hillary Clinton acting like a politician. I, I, I'll tell you this, uh, the, the best news that, 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 that I've heard over the last um, so many weeks was this morning. Larry, uh, um, Lindsey Graham uh, dropped out. When I read that, I got online this morning. I didn't know he dropped out until I got online this morning. I, and then when I got online and saw the headlines up there on the internet that he had dropped out, that was the best news I could have heard. Uh, I could have read because Lindsey Graham, um, I don't know, you look at Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham uh, um, supports book burning. Now, you might say, well, I don't see him burning in the books. Look what he did down there with the, with the Confederate, with the so-called Confederate flag. And that's also true of Tim Scott. I don't have respect for either one of them. That's book burning. You know, I, I had people in the studio the other day were actually advocating. She brought up, one woman brought up about the Confederate flag. flag. She was a black lady. And I said about the, you know, she's glad it's being done this way. And I went, what about the First Amendment? She goes, we don't need it. That's not what it was for. The First Amendment's not for that. She also wants to, uh, she wants to go after the NRA and uh, destroy that, which is actually directly representation of the people out there. If ever, they say the, NR, the NARL group, you know, for women's right to abortion, mm -hmm. is considered so seminal because, you know, they're speaking for women. How come they only have 75,000 members? The NRA's got five, over 5 million members. Yeah. So guess what? If that's for me, if they say that represents NARL numbers, actually represents represents, you know, two women uh, who don't join but are now, there's members but they represent two out there who didn't actually officially join and pay dues, then uh, when you got five million members, I'd say that probably speaks for 30 million uh, Americans. So they, they, they Hillary, all Americans, Hillary Clinton, they or not. Hillary Clinton's attacking a group of people that actually, a group that actually represents the interests, the ideas, and mm -hmm. beliefs of 30 million Americans, and we're supposed to say, yeah, and all the liberals saying, Go for it. Now, they're basically shutting everybody else. They're, they always claim democracy, but only when they 
in de- de- you know, the numbers count in democracy. Mm-hmm. Okay, basically, mob can rule in a true democracy. But we'll go. That's another point. Mm-hmm. But these people want to do away with the concepts. They they stand on and scream about it all the time. But when it's used against them, they don't want to stop it. We we have got to stop uh, trying to pick and choose what parts of the Constitution we are going to uh, endorse and demand the enforcement. It's a whole document, and it must be either enforce as a whole document or you repudiate the whole document when any part of it is in fact disclaimed. And I and I say anything about politicians, I'm just saying that if this idea of trying to search out which one of them in the Congress is is doing um, the positive things toward the American people and which ones are not doing it and we try to get a search warrant out and get a uh, mic um, one one of those uh, magnifying glasses to find out which one is doing whatever it's the it's the whole um, political situation and all the politicians are guilty of malfeasance in office and we need to stop lying about this Uh, it's, it's no less these other thank you John it's no less these other people than it is um, the ones who are most more gracious in it. And I, I was listening to to, um, to Lizzie Graham talking about as he was bowing out. Excuse me. B- bowing out and saying that those that would be running and would be the nominee will in fact adopt his 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 uh, his, his policy. Uh, toward uh, the treatment of ISIS. Shut up. Uh, you, your policy was rejected by the American people. And if you you didn't even have one percent of the of the vote inside the Republican Party, how are they going to adopt anything you said? And you weren't able to attract any voters to your campaign. That's nonsense. And when Hillary Clinton was saying that a video was causing this, let me tell you what the recruitment is of um, of uh, of ISIS. What what's, what's recruiting people to uh, to, uh, to ISIS? What's recruiting people to ISIS is not whether or not the two sides are right and wrong. It's not a matter of right and wrong. The recruitment is which side seems most certain of what it's doing. And so the recruitment is, and let me name them for you. The recruitment is Angela Merkel of Germany, Francois Hollande in France, this derelict in, um, in, in, in England, James Cameron, and this buffoon you have in Washington, D.C. These people are, these people, these are the recruitments for ISIS. Because when they see them backing up, you want to stop the recruitment of ISIS? Donald Trump stops it. Uh, maybe you didn't see it in 1981 when before Reagan took office. Why those same uh, annual tolas, the ones that come in there under the annual tola Ruhalo Khomeini, who had come into power in, in 1979, when Reagan was elected in 1980, before he took office, they let those hostages go. You know why? Because they knew that this man was not playing. You would not have had Reagan after uh, 911 to go in front of the camera talking about a religion that had just murdered people in the name of religion and murdered 3,000 Americans get up there and then say that um, Islam is a peaceful religion when you just saw it acting out what it really is, which is a, a, a war, which is a religion of war, and then and claim it's a religion of peace, and 3,000 Americans, are, this was a desecration of those persons that, that had been murdered on 911. And those that saw him do that, that recruited uh, Islam. That, that recruited people to this uh, jihadist movement in, 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 in Islam. <clears throat> That's recruitment of, of, of uh, ISIS. The, the capitulation of the leadership in the West is a recruitment tool of, um, of Islam. And when they see these people like Hillary Clinton making these outrageous comments, that recruits people to Islam because they see that the West is not certain of its footing. And so when I hear her saying things like that, I, I tell you what, <laughs> I tell you what, I, what, I, what really got, I, I had to laugh last week because there was a guy that asked uh, Chris Matthews, this was one of the best things that, that could have happened um, uh, last week. 
<laughs> One guy went to Chris Matthews on MSNBC. You know, the guy that said he's going to thrill up his leg every time Obama speaks. And the guy asked Chris, John, did you see this? The guy asked Chris Matthews, uh, how, how's your leg? <laughs> how, how's your leg? And Matthew said, how's my leg? He said, yeah, how, did you see that, John? He said, uh, how, how's your leg doing? <laughs> and he asked him if he had had surgery on his leg. Because uh, Chris Matthews, you know, this is B.B. King. The thrill is gone. The thrill is not gone from this guy. He still got a thrill of his leg. And Obama been talking for seven years and doing the country in. And Chris Matthews still got a thrill going up his leg. <laughs> You know, I think I think Michelle's are jealous because I mean, she doesn't feel that way about Barack. You know, <laughs> she's yeah. like, see, what what are between you here and the Barack? You know? <laughs> yeah, that there's a lot of of, of uh, I mean, you can say a lot, a lot you can say about that. But Matthews, that that was really that made my that made I, for two days. I, that made my day for two days last week. I said, wow, that was really um, that was a Kodak moment. I think BB King would would uh would have liked that the thriller the thriller's gone. Look, let's be honest here. We have a determined enemy, and what stands him down are these political figures that are willing to call it like it is and say it as it is. Political correctness is recruiting uh, ISIS. That's what the recruitment is. And when she said there was a video that did it, that means this woman has a learning curve of zero because she used it in 2012. And we found out that to be a lie. We found her going on that helicopter, helicopter where she was supposed to be under fire. We found out that was a lie. That's all Hillary Clinton does is lie. And they got this woman as, as the future standard bearer for the Democratic Party. We have a test coming up in 2016. And if this country fails that test, I'm off Facebook <clears throat> because I know then that this country does not choose to save itself. See, I'm, I'm holding out hope that there is still, as close as we are to the cliff, we're not over, we at the edge, but we have not gone over yet. But if in 2016, when the the disaggregation of the issue is so clear or uh, what we're dealing with here with these incumbent politicians this woman been on the national scene for 25 years her record is very clear and they're going to talk about and here's Bernie Sanders talking about somebody being a pathological liar Donald Trump a pathological liar and use the fact that they couldn't find anything on TV or in the news that showed anybody cheering on 911 as if that's going to be on the news. As if they're going to cover that in, in the news. They alluded to it, and I saw it, I saw it also. They were cheering. And just because it wasn't covered doesn't mean it didn't happen. In fact, I think it's really ridiculous for you to put in front of the American people this insulting way of looking at it by saying because it's not, there are not any videos of it. There are no videos of what Hillary Clinton is talking about, but it didn't keep you from talking about it. There are no videos where anybody is going around door to door, knocking on doors and saying, look, this is what Donald Trump said. You want to join up? That's, this is a piece of religion. It takes a video to get them off of being peaceful. This is absurd. And we have people that are running for president right now that have clearly identified themselves as the enemy of the American people. Hillary Clinton is an enemy of the American people. And so is Obama. I understand what you did in 2008. You were trying to, because Americans are, you know, very, you know, goodwill. But you know what? It's like Malino says. Excessive compassion. Excessive compassion is a sin. I mean, you can be compassionate to a fault. And I know what you did in 2008 with Obama. I know what the sentiment was. Let's get over this hurdle. Let's do this. Put this man in. Let's get past some of the past things that have occurred in our history. And let's heal the nation's wounds. I mean, that's what Lincoln said in his um, second inaugural address. Malice toward none. And let's heal the nation's I understand all of that. 
all the way up from 1864 to 2008. But 2012, that doesn't work anymore. We had four years, and that doesn't work. But we did it anyway, and this is the result that you have. I want to see political correctness get out of here. We have an opportunity in 2006, 16, 2016 to correct the imbalance inside of the body politic. And I will tell you this, and I'm going to say this to you directly and up front. This is your last chance. It may well be a done deal now, but I'm, I don't think I can say sick or fork in it at this point. Because there is a choice, a clear choice to be made in 2016. And you know who knows it better than anybody else does? The people who are now talking about running a third party, if Donald Trump wins the nomination in the Republican Party, the GOP is now talking about a third party can, can, uh, campaign. Did you read about, uh, read about that? Because they know what this means. They're all the same. And they understand what, what, what this election is about, even if the American people doesn't understand it. I give you, I, look, I forgive everybody for 2008. I understand what you're doing. But it's time to come clean with ourselves at this point. We cannot make a critical mistake eight years after the mistake we made in 2008. And, and Obama was a mistake. There's no question about that. This was a horrendous mistake. This man is a... This man should be impeached on Article 2, Section 4. All persons can be impeached. All civil officers in the United States can be impeached and removed from office under Article 2, Section 4. The first thing it mentions is for, for treason. And Barack Obama is guilty of treason and there's absolutely no question about it. I'm not here to lie to you about it. This man is guilty of treason. <clears throat> and we'll be removed from office if we had politicians. We had statesmen up there, not politicians. We don't have uh, statesmen. We have politicians. And that's why he remains in office. <clears throat> and it's now talking about, well, he's only, by the time we impeach him now, he'll be out of office by that time. You need to do it in order to, re to restore the rule of law. And by them not doing it, that's a statement about who they are. And we've got to send some people in there in, as an insurgent inside of the body politic to change that. And we have a chance to do it in 2016. If it's not Trump, be somebody else. It needs to be somebody else if it's not Trump. But it cannot be them. It can't be Christie. It cannot be Cassidy. It cannot be any of these politicians. Tim Scott proves that with what he did down there and talking about the flag. The, by, by the way, both Lindsey Graham and, and Tim Scott took a position. That's part of the Southern heritage until that became unpopular and then they ran to the cracks. Once it was clear that the mood has, has shifted, then they ran for burning the books, which is what that was about. See, I, I, that was a person got on my wall last week. I was talking about that we, you need not change what's on, the, on, on Mount Rushmore because that's history. That's what the guy did in 1925. We'd had 30 presidents at that point, only 14 since that point. <clears throat> so that was put up there in 1925, and that's history. I'm not talking about taking them down. I'm talking about another mountain. That's in South Dakota. Put another mountain, uh, some, uh, let's do another mountain in North Dakota. And let's put one president up there. That's George Washington. And put up there either Cochise, Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, or Chief Joseph. Only one, not all, all four. To make a statement here. <clears throat> you see, I don't think you erase history. You add to it. <clears throat> and that's what they're missing in terms of taking uh, down the flag and putting the museum. That's, that is an outrage. Particularly if you know the history of, um, of, of that. And I do know the history of it very well. And I'll be talking to you about it um, after we get through past the holidays. Because we got to do a correction here. Okay, I, we started out talking about Merry Christmas. And I really do hope everybody will have a Merry Christmas. And we are now getting ready to start approaching, after Christmas, the coming year. And I hope everybody will also have 
a happy new year and the year years thereafter. Until next week, enjoy Christmas with your family, other holidays as well, and we'll see you next week here at allpointstv.com and the program called What's Going On. See you then.